Hey, well, thank you for tuning in to another Searching for the Sacred, where I want to help you continue to find the divine one breath at a time. Today, I want to answer the question, how do I study the Bible faithfully? How do you study the Bible faithfully? Because it's possible to study the Bible without faithfulness. It's possible that people are studying the Bible and coming to conclusions and applications that are crazy, that aren't faithfully looking at it. I love the Bible. I love it because it's God's words to us. Behind me is a tapestry of the book of Exodus in the Old Testament of the Bible. It starts up here with the story and winds its way all the way to the end on the other side. It's awesome. It just portrays in visual form what was going on in the book of Exodus when I taught that years ago. I love the Bible. And I want to give you these principles that will help you study the Bible faithfully so you understand it practically and to be able to apply it to your life and understand what's going on. So here's some, some principles for studying and understanding the Bible. Number one is context of the author. It is so important you figure out what's the context of the author. Since the Bible is God moving in the hearts of people to write his revelation down in human language for us to understand, it must be treated the same way as any other communication. Listen, the goal is to determine the author's intended meaning. When Moses wrote Exodus, what did he intend to communicate to us? What was on God's heart when that book was given to us? We have to figure out what's the intended meaning behind what the author wanted. This requires us to understand, number one, the culture of what is happening in the author's life, and number two, the context of the passage that we're studying. There are two contexts to consider. The historical context, which would include, you know, the physical layout, the geographic layout, the culture, ideology of the author, the people whom he's writing to, that's part of the context. The second area of context would be literary context. What kind of language is this? You know, what, is it, what literary form is this? Is this poetry? Is this facts? Is this a story? Is it a parable? What is it? in the immediate context of the passage. So very important, the historical context and the literary context. So the context of the author is so important to understand, and many people miss this. They, do, they don't read the Bible to figure out what is the author talking about? What's their context? When did they live? Where did they live? Who are they communicating to? That's all number one. Number two is the truth of biblical scripture. Since God is the author behind the authors, so to speak, the biblical scriptures must be interpreted to be true in all its parts. Well, what do I mean by that? It's unified in all its parts. From Genesis all the way through Revelation and the closed canon of biblical scripture, it's unified and it's true in all its parts. And since scripture is true in all its parts, we must be careful to interpret scripture and not disallow a portion of scripture there. We can't just disallow it because we don't like it or because it, it seems like it's in conflict with like scientific theory or historical source or some contemporary theory and psychology or sociology or some world system that seems to be in conflict with it or our emotions just because we don't like what it says. We can't disregard it. It's true in all its parts. It's unified in all its parts. Understand that all the biblical scriptures are true and they're from God. A true unity must be sought by, by the one who is to understand scripture. The Bible must be compared to other biblical verses because the Bible is the best commentary on the Bible. Think about that. The Bible is the best commentary on the Bible. So if something in the second half of the Bible called the New Testament says something about the first half of the Bible, the Old Testament, then the New Testament would trump the meaning. So when Jesus comes along and he teaches on something that has to do with the Old Testament, you have to assume that Jesus knew what he was talking about and he's the best interpreter of the Bible. So we have to layer it all together. Let me give you another example. Matthew, who wrote the Gospel of Matthew, was writing primarily to a Jewish audience. He wanted them to understand that Jesus was the Messiah, so he he quoted the first half, the Old Testament of the Bible, all the time, hundreds of times. And he would interpret it best. 
So it trumps any meaning we had about the Old Testament when Matthew comes along and explains it with better meaning for us. Does that make sense? So the truth of biblical scripture, unified and true in all its parts. Finally, number three is the authority of the Bible. The authority of the Bible. The Bible and only the Bible is the absolute authority for faith and life. It has everything we need to know about living for God. All the principles and techniques for deriving the meaning of the biblical passage must conform to the principles that the Bible itself is the final authority and not you and I. You know, we think that we're the center of the universe sometimes. We think everything revolves around us, but it doesn't. It revolves around God and his words in the Bible to us. So our systems and tips and tactics and even how we approach the Bible are flawed. They don't have the authority. The Bible alone has the final authority. So the primary purpose of, of God revealing the Bible to us, his divine revelation to us, the, the purpose of all that is for us to come have a relationship with him. It's called salvation. The purpose is for us to be saved from our mistakes against God. That's why Jesus came. That's the purpose of the whole Bible. Everything points to Jesus. The Bible is not given to teach us that there, there is just an infinite God all about the universe or every part of the earth or science or everything else. The primary purpose of the Bible given to us was so that we would have a relationship with Jesus. Listen closely. The purpose of God's revelation is not biology. It's not psychology. It's sociology. The purpose is to reconcile people back to God and restore people to live in right relationship with Him. When you approach the Bible that way, everything changes. Your eyes are opened up to, wow, this isn't being caught in the details or seeing the trees before the forest. This is seeing that God wants a personal relationship with us. You might have heard around Christmas time, it's Emmanuel, God with us, coming to earth to be with us. That's the purpose of the whole Bible. As a matter of fact, John, Jesus' closest follower, wrote this in the Gospel of John. He said, Jesus performed many other miracles and signs in the presence of his disciples, his followers, which are not recorded in this book, but is written down that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah. That's why Jesus came. That's why. So the goal of biblical study should be to determine the author's original intent, who is he writing to, understand that the whole purpose of this is for you to have a relationship with God, and the extent of that authority is God does not rest upon our fallible interpretations of the Bible. God is totally outside space and time. So when he gave us the Bible, he gave it to us so that we, we in our language, so that we can understand it and dissect it and begin to understand what, what he's about so we can have a relationship with him. Well, that's it. That's how you study the Bible faithfully. I'm going to give you many more episodes like this around Bible study that I hope are very helpful to you. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Searching for the Sacred. Be sure to comment below and give other topics along the way. And if this is helpful, share it with the people that you know. Uh, and I hope, I hope you continue to grow to, buy, to, to study the Bible with faithfulness. Thanks for tuning in.